fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. So joining us is uh, Mark Ebner, the Mark Ebner. Thanks for being here, Mark. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, I'm feeling your tongue firmly planted in your cheek there when you uh, describe Scientology as a well-respected church. But if that's how you feel, then we're, go- we're going to war, my friend. Other than that, have at it. Yeah, no, no. That's just, it's, uh, it's crazy. I, I, you know, I looked at the Scientology church from the, from the start, and just looking at L. Ron Hubbard, it's, uh, you know, he's just disgusting, uh, rotten teeth. Uh, how can anybody follow that? And, and I, I, I still can't wrap my head around it. And um, Well, you know, if you want to talk about L. Ron Hubbard, you can start with uh, the truth about L. Ron Hubbard. Yes, he was a uh, prolific science fiction writer. Uh, he actually garnered a bunch of fans with his science fiction over the years. Um, I can't take that away from him, but at some point in his career, as the story goes, he decided that working as a nickel a word science fiction author wasn't going to cut it. And in conversation, he uh, said that uh, if you want to make a million bucks, start your own religion. And that's exactly what he did, except none of what he started was his own Uh, sort of springboarding off a deep, deep resentment that he had for the mental health field at the time. What he did was he actually borrowed uh, techniques and, you know, a mishmash of other uh, uh, things from the mental health community, particularly at the time it would have been uh, Freud and Carl Jung. And he threw that into a pot and came up with something he called Scientology. Now, um, what's interesting is, is that uh, he wrote a book called Dianetics, at a time where, where here in the states, anyway, we were, you know, we were kind of uh, uh, receptive to these. I, I, this is pre New Age stuff, but that's it, that's the spirit it was taken in. He made a lot of promises. L. Ron Hubbard promised total freedom. He promised a bridge to total freedom. He promised a lot of things that he could not deliver on. He knew that. So what he did was he uh, essentially set up a Ponzi scheme that is still victimizing people, although not many, to this day. Yeah, it's crazy. He's a Ponzi guy. Yeah. Carnival barker. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's Miscavige that does it. Um, it's, so yeah, you, David Miscavige. That yeah. would be uh, Tom Cruise's best uh, buddy. They like to wrestle together. They ride motorcycles together, and they both are on a, a seemingly endless promotional tour for the dwindling cult of Scientology. Yeah, yeah, they're struggling, it, it, but if, but they've got the IRS tax exemption, and that really is what keeps them alive. Exactly. That is that's the sticking point. And, you know, you'll see that uh, Leah Remini uh, with her Scientology and uh, the Aftermath series on A&E partnered with uh, Hubbard's former, well, Miscavige, I should say, David Miscavige, the 
uh, self-appointed chairman of the board of Scientology, uh, paired with him, uh, they are sus- uh, essentially walking billboards uh, for the cult. The only problem is is that their actual membership is dwindling to the point where, while they claim millions of members worldwide, uh, right now I would say a liberal estimate of the current membership would be about uh, 20,000 worldwide. Wow. Now, I mean, you, you say, well, well, how do they exist? Well, they exist because, A, they're real estate rich, and, B, they have, and I think I, I need to kind of uh, tip my hat to Tony Ortega over at the underground bunker, um, who's been emphasizing this. The reason how, how they stay afloat is because of the quote-unquote whales that they've meant to uh, that they've managed to keep in the flock. Now, a whale in Vegas is, you know, a casino's best friend. It's the, you know, the guy from Taiwan or, you know, from wherever who comes in with an enormous stake prepared to lose it on the gambling floor. Um, these are people who are more than happy to throw good money after bat. You find that in the celebrity realm. Nancy Cartwright was recently, um, uh, for lack of a better word, exposed. For your listeners, Nancy Cartwright is the premier voice of voices on The Simpsons show. Mm -hmm. Um, She's donated $15 million to Scientology, and she's just one of them. You know money is coming in from the remaining celebrities in Scientology, uh, you know, vast amounts from Tom Cruise, Kirstie Alley, uh, Beck, uh, who else? Ann Archer, <laughs> um, John Travolta, his wife, you know, and on and on and on. You know, so that's uh, quite a cash infusion for them. Um, however, the jury's out on Scientology. The secrets are out. You know, uh I practically made a cottage industry out of exposing Scientology, basically, you know, out of self-preservation, because when I wrote the uh, expose, Do You Want to Buy a Bridge for Spy Magazine back in 1996, um, they've been harassing me ever since. I knew that going in, uh, and um, as you... uh, mentioned when we were talking <laughs> earlier, you know, what I did to foil their efforts was the my lead paragraph in that story said, look, you know, I'm an ex-drug addict. I've been arrested. I've been under psychiatric care. I owe the IRS $6,000 at the time that they're well aware of. And being that it was in the Clinton era, when I wrote that story, I said, I've masturbated and inhaled at the same time. So Scientology, so cult, take your best shot. Well, they've tried and they fail at every turn because my resolve against that kind of harassment was to every time they came after me was to write 10 more stories about Scientology. And I've done as much over the years. So you, you actually, to do that, you walked in Scientology and said you want to be a Scientologist, didn't you? Yes, I did. And I figured that was the only way. I had very limited knowledge about Scientology. In fact, when I pitched the story, I was just kind of bewildered by all these uh, sailor-suited swabbies that were marching around Hollywood they they marched like they had a purpose, but they didn't really seem to be getting anything done. And, you know, I was like, who are these people, these drones, you know, walking around wearing lanyards and lip and uh, and stripes on their ersatz naval costumes? You know, who were these people? But I but what I, I was warned that they would come after me. So I had to do my diligence, and that I did. So given that, I think it would be a fair statement to say that uh, another way that they keep their numbers up is intimidation 
for errant members or members that are straying? Um, yeah, I don't know how that keeps their numbers up. I mean, the goal, as expressed by L. Ron Hubbard, and these were his words about dealing with quote unquote enemies or critics of the church or in Scientology parlance, SPs or suppressive people mm-hmm. was to, and this is doctrine because you need to understand that anything Hubbard said or wrote became unalterable scripture in Scientology. It's like a president when he speaks. He is uh, a president. No matter what he says, that becomes policy when it's entered into the public record. Well, the same was true for uh, Hubbard and his cult. And his, uh, his instructions for dealing with critics was to lie, trick, harass, sue, and or otherwise destroy that person. That is doctrine, you know? And um, it, the goal was to, and I quote again, shudder them into silence, okay? These are really drastic measures and drastic threats. And yet at the same time, it worked for years because people didn't, couldn't withstand you know, a cult that was attempting to litigate them to death. I mean, you know, I've always, you know, said, unlike, I don't know, Synanon, if you remember them in the 60s, they were a a Venice Beach, uh, California-centered cult and uh, quasi-drug rehabilitation thing. You know, you see the hallmark of a cult is to go after the weakest people. And certainly drug addicts are, you know, uh, in the throes of their addiction are very vulnerable to this sort of thing. Well, Synanon was later exposed as, to put it mildly, the snake in the mailbox cult. Scientology may not put a snake in your mailbox, but they will try to litigate you to death. However, they can't, they can't afford enough lawyers to go after every critic when really the entire educated world today almost is against Scientology. Once again, the secrets are out, and I'm quite frankly proud of my small part into getting those secrets out there. What do you think of, of Miscavige's wife? Where do you think she is? Well, she's, uh, I, I believe, I, I, I'm not quite sure. I know that she is, has been essentially imprisoned uh, in a Scientology property. Now, I don't, someone will need to correct me on this, but I, I think it may be up in Lake Arrowhead, or it's one of their remote properties. And she was pushed out of the way, essentially when, for whatever reason, Miscavige got sick of her or she she said or did the wrong thing. And he just disposed of her, in the words of Hubbard, quietly, or so he thought, and without sorrow. You see? It's just, you know, and this is... uh, this is how cults operate. They disappear people. And, you know, that, you know, becomes a whole other topic for the mystery element of your show. What happened to, you know, Shelley Miscavige? Well, you can see what happens to people in the fold that ask those questions. I mean, the whole reason why, well, one of the main reasons why Leah Remini left the cult was because she had the quote unquote nerve at some event over uh, it was a I, I it was Tom Cruise's wedding for God's sakes I believe to uh, uh, Katie Holmes at the time um, she went up to Miscavige and said Hey where's Shelley and you know they were like you don't have the rank to a- ask that sort of question they created the animus. Uh, 
fortunately, Leah Remini in her, you know, deep down in her soul somewhere, she's a tough broad from Brooklyn, and she wasn't having it. And she woke up, she got out, and to her credit, you know, she did what you have to do if you leave at that level, and that is, you know, come at them with both barrels blazing. And I credit uh, the Arts and Entertainment Network for giving her that platform. Uh, yeah, you know, I wonder. I wonder if she's under attack a lot now. Oh, oh, yeah, no, so. she absolutely yeah. is. And and more than that, any uh, apostate, for lack of a better word, that comes on her show uh, before the show is even over, uh, with all their digital technology at hand at Scientology Incorporated, they've a- already prepared a hate video of, you know, the the people that appear on her show. And they do this to try and uh, discredit those people within their flock. But if you begin to look silly after a while, and this will show you the power of mind control, because all they're concerned with is, uh, you know, appeasing their very small membership and their high-powered uh, um, members like celebrities and that sort of thing to make them believe that they're doing okay and that anyone who speaks out against the church is a criminal. So what they do is they try and paint you as such. So, you know, for people to go on Leah Remini's show, they risk a lot in terms of, you know, exposure by the cult. But you have people like myself, platforms like your show, her show, Tony Ortega over at the Underground Bunker, who are very quick to point out that this is exactly how they harass, you know, actual free thinking individuals, you know, who frankly, you know, have every reason to complain about the cult because they are victims of a global scam. That is Scientology. Back to my original point about Scientology being a, uh, an insidious Ponzi scheme. Well, you know, I guess what because if they delivered, if Scientology delivered half of what they say they can deliver, then we'd have superhumans running all over the planet. <laughs> you know, Tom Cruise is supposed to be at a level where he has uh, control over what they call MEST, M-E-S-T, right? Matter, energy, space, and time. Well. If he's all that, how come he's still under five six and stepping on apple crates during interviews? You know, how come he can't create a hit out of, you know, movies that he's actually bombed it? Now, someone could come to, to me and say, well, Mission Impossible is the biggest series. Oh, yeah, yeah, the movies make money. I get it. You know, those franchise movies. Yeah. But, you know... The guy, I, I can't also can't take away for the fact that that guy's as old as me and he looks really good. And, you know, he looks good in front of a camera, you know. But does that mean he's, you know, a soulful actor at his core? I don't think so. Yeah, no. He's, yeah. he's terrible. Um, <laughs> well, he is. I, I just, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, he is. I just, I just wonder what, how do you, what confuses me is, okay, going clear, you know, all this mental stuff, make you a better person. But they have some really weird things in their in their religion, like weird beliefs. Oh, wow. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's what confuses yeah. me. When you start getting into aliens and beings and all this weird stuff, and you look at L. Ron Hubbard and you look at the whole setup, how, how do they buy into that upper level stuff? Well, it's very simple. They, they, you know, and and this is how Ponzi schemes work. They loop you in with an offer you can't refuse. Scientology can help you with that. They pull you off the street. You know, for me, when I went in, they were like, "Well, what do you want to improve your life in your life?" And I was like, uh, "I want to quit smoking." 
okay, I was, you know, wandering down Hollywood Boulevard, and the way I went in to research my story was from, in through a Dianetics testing center, okay? This is how it works. They were, at the time, they called them personality tests. And what they give you is essentially a, uh, a pretty straightforward psychological test. And, you know, they, they printed out the results and they said, Ooh, you're angry. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm walking down Hollywood Boulevard, chain smoking Newport cigarettes. Yeah. I got a bit of, of anger in me, you know, Oh, Scientology can help you with that. And we can help you quit smoking. But then when I'm finally, you know, uh, routed over to the big blue property on Sunset Boulevard, you know, Scientology Central in Hollywood, I find out that in the emulation of their fearless leader, L, the late megalomaniacal maniac L. Ron Hubbard, they all chain smoke, you know? <laughs> so how are they going to help me quit smoking? <laughs> They'll promise you anything except, you know, it, it's, it's all a joke because they really can't deliver on their prop, promises. But here's the hook. When you come in, they start you off with basic auditing. Auditing is what? Greek for to listen. Okay? Yeah. And they sit there and they put you in these quote-unquote counseling sessions. They hook you up to this e-meter. So now it's all fancy. They've introduced a, a mysterious device, which is, in essence, basically a lie detector. And uh, they start asking you questions. These are deeply personal questions about trauma that you may have uh, had in your lifetime. Or because it's a reincarnative cult, they, you know, they, you know, eventually with this, they will go into your, uh, you see what I mean, your prior lives. But in the moment, what's happening is you're talking about things like, okay, I'll give you an example. Okay, Mark. Take us back to a uh, a moment of trauma in your life. And I said, well, I fell out of a tree when I was six years old. I was knocked unconscious. I got a concussion. I went to the hospital. You tell them the story. And then they say, okay, let's go back to the beginning. Now, this is hours of this. So they get every detail of that specific point of trauma for you, right? Yeah. And you keep repeating it over and over again. And hours later, by the end of it, you're laughing. You see what I'm saying? Because it's so friggin' absurd at that point. And then they say, they look at the meter and the needle on the meter starts floating, right? And they say, your needle is floating. That's a good sign. And they, they have you believe that you've blown the charge of that particular point of trauma. And then they go into other stuff. Uh, give me another thing. Well, you know, daddy touched me improper, you know, anything, right? Now, here's the insidious thing behind that. You are sitting there for many years if you choose to remain in Scientology, letting them record your innermost secrets. So they've also had you sign a bunch of documents. So everything you say in an auditing room becomes property of Scientology Incorporated. You see what I'm saying? Right. Now they have a dossier on you that they own. So imagine if you're John Travolta, you know, and, uh, you know, let's say theoretically you've had affairs with men and you don't feel good about that right and right. you want and, and you divulge that in an auditing session well guess what if john travolta ever decides to leave scientology uh, or worse yet speak critical about it they would have no compunction about releasing disseminating that dossier that they have on you to destroy you. So imagine having that hanging over your head. He's between a rock and a high place, a hard place. John Travolta cannot leave because and, and they have the goods on him. 
There How insidious is that? And and that was my theory. That's why I said that sometimes they can keep their numbers up through intimidation. That's what I meant. Oh, but, oh I see. Yes. Let, let's look yes. at today's society. Yeah, it, but in today's society, do you think that would work? Because now we're a much more emboldened and a much more open society. Why can't our example here, John Travolta, say, okay, listen, I did it. It's behind me. Um, I don't care anymore. You know, kind of take the right. approach that, that you have. Okay, I did these. I did these things. Uh, enough. Well, I can I, answer. I can answer that. Why they can't? They, why can't they? Because you got to understand, and you kind of mentioned this earlier in the conversation. When you're dealing with Hubbard's cos cosmology, the really pricey space alien type stuff, which, by the way, was brilliantly exposed in, I don't know if you saw it or not, but the uh, South Park episode, Trapped in the Closet, that uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker invited me to come down and consult on, yes. the highest rated episode of South Park ever, the Emmy Award winning nominated uh, episode of South Park, in cartoon form, they revealed those secrets. While at the same time flashing on the screen, this is what Scientologists believe. You know, with the volcano, with the volcano and Lord Zenu and OT3 and all that stuff. Now it seems strange to the average viewer, but remember, this is the stuff that they fought years to protect because, oh, the, you know, you plebs are not ready for this yet. Of course not. That's how Ponzi schemes work, and that's how they come crashing down on you, because whereas where at first you may feel like some sort of emotional charge or relief, you know, in some of the hocus pocus they um, therapy and hypnosis they do to you by way of auditing early on, when you get up to those higher levels, you have to understand that like John Travolta, Tom Cruise, Kirstie Alley, you have been indoctrinated to a point where you do not know black from white, you see? And you you buy all that uh, alien hocus-pocus hocus wholesale because it's being spoon-fed to you by the cult that has you to the point where you're going to believe that you can walk through a wall of fire, that you can control matter, energy, space, and time. All of these things are disprovable, but it all goes back to what my warning for anyone considering, you know, having anything to do with Scientology, do not ever underestimate the power of mind control. It's as simple as that, you know? This isn't a conspiracy theory. This is fact. And if there's one thing that Hubbard and Scientology perfected was mind control. And, you know, and that's what they use. And it is powerful. And I'll give them that. But unfortunately, sooner or later, every Scientologist, no matter how deep you get into it, you know, actually snaps out of it or comes to or is guided out of it at some point in their life. And then they look over their shoulder and they say, oh, my God, I gave my life. I gave all my money to this. And guess what? Hubbard was wrong. This quote unquote technology does not work. And oh, my God. And then they're angry. You see, because and who wouldn't be angry? I want my life back. Yeah, well, you, I want my life back, and the only way to do that is to retaliate against the cult of Scientology. And that's why you see so many high-profile ex-Scientologists who are doing just that. Jason Begay, you know, the actor who came out against them and said, come on, show me a clear. Who's gone <laughs> clear? You know, give me a break. And on and on and on. And, you know... It's uh, at this point, you know, I wish to say we were just in a place where we could just, you know, urinate on the grave 
of what was once an insidious control cult, but it's still going on because they have vast resources of cash from their quote unquote whales and they have immense amounts of property. The ironic part is, is that this property, for instance, David Miscavige seems obsessed with opening up all these glittering, what he calls ideal orcs all over the world. You know, these, these, uh, fancy storefront Scientology op, op, you know, uh, uh, buildings that are popping up everywhere. Okay, so they got the real estate, but is there anyone going in there for quote unquote services? No. These places remain empty. But it's not coming out of Scientology coffers. They get their whales to finance these things. And then they give them a plaque that calls them, you know, a cheap plaque that calls them patron emeritus or whatever. And thanks for donating $15 million. You know, the, um, but back to the original thing. Yes, the real sticking point is the IRS. And that goes back to, I believe, in the 80s, uh, Hubbard, when he was still somewhat coherent and vital, uh, launched an, uh, a, uh, a, a, uh, an operation called Operation uh, Snow White. And they, he sent his wife. You see, Hubbard was a coward. Most narcissist sociopaths are cowards. Uh, but with him, it was extra special because he sent his wife in to do the dirty business of breaking into IRS offices, stealing documents, creating um, uh, compromat, if you will, against certain high-level members of the IRS and, in essence, doing achieving what he uh, did any time he faced uh, an enemy, and that was shudder them into silence. The IRS, cowards that they were, threw their hands up. They got... They had dozens of lawsuits that uh, were frivolously filed against them by Scientology, in addition to the crimes and subterfuge. And uh, the IRS threw in the towel and awarded them 501c3 status, which means that they are a charitable, tax-exempt organization. The problem is, all they needed to do was to look to Hubbard's doctrine, and they would find out there is no charity in Scientology. He had scripture about that that said there is no charity except with, um, uh, with there is no charity without fair exchange. In other words, if we do something for you, we better either get paid or you better float us some members. Witness. Scientology volunteer ministers. You may have seen them. The uh, yellow-shirted troops that show up at disaster scenes. I saw them at 9-11 at Ground Zero when I was reporting there. You could see them all around the recent California wildfires. They're not there to help. You know, they're not there to do anything but to prey on the vulnerable. You know? And they do these little things called touch assist to, you know, so supposedly to make people feel better in the moment. I won't get into what those are exactly because I don't want to bore your listeners, <laughs> but they are there on recruiting missions. You see, no charity without fair exchange. They're a money cult. Time magazine had it before I did in spy, it, it, w before I did in spy magazine. You know, with the uh, time cover story, uh, cult of greed and power. That's all they're about. And um, so uh, the IRS really dropped the ball on this one. And, you know, it's about time they changed that. They looked into this organization, recognized them as a criminal cult, and rescinded their 501c3 status. But you try and get the IRS to budge on anything, my friend. It ain't easy, yeah. you know? And yeah. shame on them. And by the way, the one thing I left out of that was, coward that L. Ron Hubbard was, sending his wife in. She got arrested. She did fine. 
behind Operation Snow White. And what did Hubbard do? He went off into international waters, literally on his wacky ship, as an unindicted co-conspirator. Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. You know, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Now, you, 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 you also wrote a, a story for Rolling Stone, didn't you, back with uh, that uh, Cambridge student that killed himself? Yes, Philip Gale, remarkable young man, got into uh, MIT at the tender age of 14 years old. He was raised in Scientology. Both his parents were uh, big-time Scientologists. In fact, his mother, Elizabeth Gale, was the head PR uh, representative, uh, PR spokeswoman for, for Scientology at the time. I just picked up a news item. Uh, that a kid had thrown himself off the tallest building at uh, uh, MIT, and I didn't even know he was a Scientologist, but, you know, that's how I find stories. And I was like, and uh, Rolling Stone was putting together their college issue. So what I did was I pitched them the story, and next thing you know, I'm on a flight to, you know, to Boston, Mass., get off at Logan, I go to Cambridge, and uh, I'm walking around campus finding out about this prodigy and, you know, looking for reasons as to why he may have killed himself on March 13th, which coincidentally was L. Ron Hubbard's birthday. Now, coincidences aside, remember, this kid was raised in Scientology. Now, also remember, he was a genius. So he managed to get out of Scientology while he was in college to the degree that he had some sort of freeman, for, uh, freedom, if you will. But he also managed to out-logic Scientology. He recognized it for the BS that it really is. And he managed to extract himself from that. But couple that with a 14-year-old going to MIT. Couple that with having no real tools to exist socially in this breathing world, and you have a recipe for disaster. And it was really sad what happened. Well, anyway, I wrote the story. I was doing my diligence. I had to meet with his mother, and I said, look, I have written critically about Scientology. No question, Elizabeth. And she goes, yes, yes, I understand that. And I said, but this story is not a takedown in any way, shape, or form about your cult. I mean, I didn't say that, but I said about Scientology. This is about me trying to recreate the life of your son and to try and find an understanding of how he would come to kill himself at MIT at such a young age. And, um, you know, I said, so I would appreciate it, you know, if you know, with that in mind, I could come up and meet you, interview you about your son with the understanding that my goal here is not to take down Scientology. She was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, good. I went up there. I interviewed her and she ratted me out to Scientology. Scientology, in turn, sent a dead agent package. A uh, this basically they dug up all the dirt that they could find on me. Ooh, big deal. whoop de doo You know, I write about crime. You have photos of me, you know, in proximity to criminals, you know, blah, blah, blah. You can say I'm biased, this, that. You know, they did, they, they threw everything at my employer at the time, which was Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone called me after I had filed the story, mind you, and said, hey, can you answer to this? And I said, I can, but I'm not going to. There's no reason why I should have to answer to that cult when it comes to a largely unrelated story. Yeah, there was Scientology was in there because you can't avoid it, given the fact that Philip Gale was raised in the cult. But other than that, it was about his life, you know, and his genius. And what happened to him on that day that he decided to off himself. So I said, listen, I'm, you know, this is, I'm not responding to that. And they treated it like a deal breaker and they killed my story. 
So now you have a situation where if I was lawyered up, I could sue Scientology, you know, because they did exact damage on me. They, you know, they affected my livelihood. But instead, you know, the same old thing. I just come back at them 10 times harder. So in the end, Rolling Stone killed the story. I turned around. I brought it to my local weekly newspaper that I wrote, contributed to at the time, New Times. They put it on the cover. I double dipped. I got paid twice as a professional because I told Rolling Stone, pay me and pay me now. And they did, you know, which tells them that they knew that by killing my story, they were making a mistake. So I got paid twice. The story got out. It went around the world. It was focused featuring Philip Gale's sister, Elizabeth, more recently in the last season of Leah Remini's Scientology in the Aftermath. And years later, I was in a casual conversation. I won't mention uh, that person's name with my uh, assigning editor of the original Philip Gale story for Rolling Stone. I said, what the F happened there, man? And he said, well, you didn't hear this from me, but Jan Wenner, the publisher and editor-in-chief of Rolling Stone at the time, is best friends with John Travolta. And that was his answer. Oh, wow. And, you know, <laughs> if you look, go down that rabbit hole to look at the relationship with between Jan Wenner and John Travolta, all you have to do is look at one of the worst movies of all time ever made, <laughs> and that would be the movie. That, no, 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 that would nope. be perfect. Oh, a movie, okay. uh, the movie about aerobics. I oh, mean, right. it yeah. would, yeah, and that was produced by none other than Jan Wenner. So yes, they did have a relationship, both professional. And I I would imagine, given their, you know, proclivity uh, for men, if you will, all well and good, you know, (laughs) who knows what their relationship was. But the the thing was, was that it just made Rolling Stone look that much worse for killing my story in the first place because of an existing relationship between the publisher and, and a celebrity Scientologist who, by the way, is not even mentioned in the story. Um, yeah. Death of a Nethead. Any of your listeners can look at it. I'm putting my website back together painstakingly one story at a time, and I believe I have Death of a Nethead posted at www.hollywoodinterrupted.com. And, you know, people can read it and make up their own minds about that. Yeah, and we'll link it to our site as well. I mean, that's, oh, cool. That's it's really good. Um, so, have have they left you alone lately, or is they are they still kind well, of well? Lately, lately, it's hard to say. I feel like they, you know, without being paranoid, I've had you know they've sent so many private investigators, you know, to my uh, various residences through the years to go through my garbage trying to (laughs) dig up stuff on me. You know, you get inured to it after a while. Are they still following me? Of course they are, because I'm still outspoken. I'm still doing shows like this. So, of course they are. But they also, I think by now they know that I'm the wrong guy to mess with because I've lived up to my promise, and that was, come at me, I come at you ten times harder. And I have succeeded in doing so uh, for almost 20 years now. So, you know, needless to say, they don't they haven't put up the uh, hate video on me yet. You know, and I and I was on uh, Leah Remini's show and I expected it, but they just they don't do that kind of public stuff with me. I think with me, they uh they, you know, they just want to catch me in an alley somewhere and rough me up one day. I mean, I suppose that would be their dream. And yeah. uh, <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah, they're more than welcome to go through my trash. All they'll find is, my God, this guy drinks a lot of paps. Yeah. <laughs> paps Blue Ribbon? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's sad. Well, PBR you know, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, one difference is you kind of own your stuff 
and and a yeah. lot of people like John Travolta and stuff won't. Like they don't want to come out and like if you own it, like like Howard Stern or like you, you own it. Yeah, I did this, I do that, I do this. So what? People know yeah. it. So it's not like right. it's it's not like it's gonna affect your career, you know, anything like John Travolta. If all this stuff comes out, uh, it might affect his movies. It might affect his fans, you know. It might and he won't own it. He'll fight it. Yeah, but right. I, and and I, to be I, honest, I may have been... what? I'm sorry. I, I so I I well I see what Al's saying, but I think we're in a more open society nowadays. Mm. You know, a more a more accepting society. Well, I don't know. I'm kind of mixed on that because I think that if someone comes out and says that all of a sudden John Travolta's coming out and he's like been renting boys for 20 years, a lot of people that support him and love him as John Travolta in one image are not going to anymore. And that's yeah, my but it, well, yeah, no, and I think I, 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 I would agree with you, but I would also agree that, you know, just off the subject of Scientology, the, the man's work has been, you know, pretty much, you know, I, uh, okay, I'll give credit to Quentin Tarantino for somewhat resurrecting his career with Pulp Fiction. But remember, that was almost, you know, a couple of, you know, that was years and years ago. But, so, you know, he's, he also did Battlefield Earth. I warned them not to make that movie. You know, I got a copy of the script long before they ever went into production. I tore off the cover page. I, I renamed the script Dark Forces, something generic. I picked a screenwriter, fake screenwriter name that sounded vaguely tabloidish and British. I called him Desmond Finch, and I submitted that script to uh, various story analysts, script readers, and uh, studios, agencies. I sent it out. I was writing for a magazine called Black Book out of New York at the time. And essentially what I did was they all came back and they all passed on the project. And they were like, this is horrible. Uh, this is the worst thing I've ever read. You've got to be kidding me. This is nonsense. It, it, the story doesn't make sense, blah, blah, blah. And we published the coverage, which was a flashing red light saying, don't make this movie. Well, they made the movie. As it turns out, it is arguably one of the worst movies ever made, if not the worst. And I had the pleasure of, in 2000, I was doing a radio show, a little syndicated radio show, five major cities, and uh, I had the author, J.D. Shapiro, the original writer of the Battlefield Earth script, on my show w with the uh, owner of the Razzie Awards, which give away, gives away the awards coincident with the Academy Awards every year for the worst movies. I had him present the Razzie Award to J.D. Shapiro. And J.D., being the good sport that he was, he accepted that Razzie Award on my show. So, fait accompli with Battlefield Earth, which was absolutely horrible. I also showed up at the, uh, uh, the, the big press event they had for the International Press Court, the Four Seasons Hotel, in Los Angeles, I walked in. the The flax and publicists were all like, "Ebner, no, no uh, uh, questions about Scientology." I was like, "Sure, right, right, right." Well, my first question for Travolta to Travolta was about the parallels between Battlefield Earth and L. Ron Hubbard's, um, you know, uh, anti psychiatry uh, war that he had started, and I was like, you know, well. You know, wasn't this all a metaphor for anti-psychiatry? You know, the evil people, one that you portrayed in the uh, character Turl, weren't they called cyclos? You know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> flashing red lights, here you go. And and Travolta just leaned into me and called me a sociopath. Okay, next question. So I said to Barry Pepper, the star of the movie, I said, hey, there was a scene in this movie where for no, for 
reasons unexplained, a cow standing in a pasture gets one of its legs blown off by a space gun. It gets its leg, you know, vaporized. I said, what did that have to do with anything? Barry Pepper got all indignant, and he started saying, now, well, this is a popcorn movie. This is supposed to be fun. I said, well, what's fun about blowing off a cow's leg for no reason? <laughs> and he said, hey, do you wear leather shoes? Do you wear a leather ba-? You know, so he was trying to make oh, it look like I was the bad that. guy. <laughs> yeah, so I was just like, okay, next question. And this capped it. Forrest Whitaker, who I admire greatly, great actor. I said to him, point blank, I said, Mr. Whitaker, what was this movie about? He took a moment. He leaned back in his chair. He's got this wonderful wonky eye, you know? And he, he scratched the back of his head, and he looked at me, and he said, I don't know. <laughs> and that was that. It says got, it all. I got escorted out. They were like, okay, that's enough, Abner. They practically zip-tied me and escorted me to the street. I see a bunch of Asian like uh, fans, I guess, who had congregated because, as I said, this was the Foreign Press Association uh, uh, press conference. And they were waiting for Travolta. And he came out and he was like, hey, everybody, did you like the movie? And you could hear a collective, oh, no. <laughs> and then you hear one Asian girl in the background going, but we love you, John. <laughs> and that was it. And I left. You know, uh, so needless to say, you know, it, it hasn't been this battle with Scientology fraught with, you know, all kinds of things that I could complain about because, let's face it, bashing Scientology with hard facts and evidence against them is a tremendous amount of fun, just like yeah. we're having on your show. <laughs> well, yeah, it's great, and time goes. We're out of time. But, Mark, uh, now, what's your what's your website so people know? Well, the website, like I said, I'm putting it back together one story at a time. They can definitely see Death of a Nethead at www.hollywoodinterrupted.com. I'm doing a uh, true crime podcasting for the people on my podcast called The Gray Zone with Mark Ebner. You can download that on iTunes or go right to Lib Liberated Syndication and listen to it there. And uh, I'm out and around, you know, for anyone listening who uh, wants to exchange thoughts on the side, I'm pretty transparent. Hit me the same way you guys found me, markebner59 at gmail.com. I've enjoyed my time on your show, fellas, and uh, look forward to the next. Thank you very oh, much, and, you. and I recommend everybody listen. It's, it, it shows great, and uh, he's, he's, he's a... He's a great character. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.